What is environmental health? In a nutshell, it's about reducing risks to human health from the world that we live in, from the food that we eat, what we drink, and the air that we breathe. It's about making our workplaces and the places where we live healthier and safer. It's about reducing inequalities, and it's about promoting well-being. Environmental health is one of the oldest local government professions. But today, its practitioners work in a variety of settings. They may be employed by government and its agencies, local councils, businesses, charities, or the armed services, or they may work for themselves. The professional body for people working in environmental health has had many names and headquarters since it began in 1883. One was over a bank overlooking the gardens of Buckingham Palace. Another was an old convent in Southwark that was reputed to be haunted. Today it is called the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health and has 10,000 members throughout the world. The CIEH headquarters is located in a bright modern building. Chadwick Court, near London's South Bank. A visitor from 1952, at the beginning of Queen Elizabeth's reign, would be surprised. They would find computers, flat-screen monitors, and furnishing made from recycled safety belts. The CIEH is home to an events venue that has won a national accolade as the UK's greenest conference facility. Most days, the building is humming with life. But there is history, too, in the fabric of Chadwick Court. It's found in the leather-bound minute books, going back to the earliest days of the Sanitary Inspectors Association, that are lovingly preserved in the library. It's found in the faces of general secretaries and presidents, looking out from old photographs. The first president was the great Victorian reformer, Sir Edwin Chadwick. It's found in the names spelled out in gilt letters in the council chamber, and in many other objects and artefacts that record the Chartered Institute's colourful history. Amongst the most treasured are Edwin Chadwick's walking stick and the CIEH's Royal Charter, granted by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth in 1984. The sanitary inspectors of the 19th and early 20th century are gone. But the public health inspectors and environmental health officers who helped to reshape post-war Britain can still share memories of their professional lives. Their job, amongst other duties, was to clean the air from smog and filth, to tear down slums, to improve the nation's diet, and to make workshops and offices safer. The experiences of older CIEH members go back to the 1950s, some of them can recall when the young Queen Elizabeth ruled over a country that was still scarred by bomb sites. It was a country of thick smogs, of outdoor privies, and tin baths hanging from the scullery wall, of Cold War anxieties, and of food rationing. I'm Andrew Griffiths. I worked in local government in environmental health in London for about 35 years, and then I came to work at CIH in, in 1999. What is Brewery in Mortlake, which is where the boat race ends, they had oil fired burners there and on one occasion somebody had left one of the dampers closed all night and it was burning neat oil with the result that in the morning the whole of the area was smothered in this oily soot. <laughs> and we first got to know of it when a, a woman phoned up, came into a local office with a photograph of her white poodle and then next to her was a black poodle that had actually been rolling in this stuff. And so we had to go in and look over the whole place and serve an improvement notice. What was immediately uh, owned up and said, um, we're very sorry, we're not responsible, but we're very sorry. And at a local meeting they said, well, we'll pay any expenses you've got, and would you like to join us at the bar for a drink? And that was the end of the public <laughs> meeting. <laughs> I'm Graham Dukes, I'm uh, Chief Executive of the Chartered Institute, um, uh, currently. Mm -hmm. In Hammersmith and Fulham there was a, a standing exhibition and in 71 I was appointed as, a, as the infectious disease clerk, um, general clerk in, uh, in Fulham and uh, one of my responsibilities was to look after this standing exhibition that used to have um, uh, troops of children, school children coming in at regular periods mm. during the week. Yeah. It was all to do with immunisation, it was to yeah. do with smoking, would you believe? Really? Um, the oh, reductions oh. in smoking at that time. Uh, it was to do with uh, childbirth and midwifery. Yeah. And of course, running alongside that 
was, um, and in my, my, my early student days, we used to do food hygiene training. I'm Andrew Banfield. I was president 1994 to 1996. I clearly remember my aunt taking me to school, and indeed my two brothers and sister, all through the fog. On Lavender Hill, which is still there, there were trams. And I also clearly remember the man in front of the tram with a flare walking down Lavender Hill so that the tram could go to the bottom of the hill and we could get off. That fog, uh, or smog as it became known, was notorious in that there were large numbers of deaths, particularly affected South London and led directly to the 1956 Clean Air Act, the implementation of which public health inspectors, as we subsequently came, had a major part in working on sorting that out. A major success for environmental health. I'm David Pershon. I was the president from 1999 to 2001. The smog was very disruptive of every aspect of the economy and life because of course uh, a morning spent uh, breathing smog meant your handkerchief was very dirty uh, and of course full of uh, uh, awful mucus and your clothes were very dirty people couldn't put washing out uh, the smog dominated life in an industrial city that the consensus was quite right the way across society. Something must be yeah. done about clean air and the public health departments got the job of okay. being the vanguard for that. Janet Russell, I'm the current president of the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health. I came rather later into smoke control than my uh, colleagues. I was tasked with introducing the first smoke control area into Castleford um, as a, a young mm. woman of 22, mm. uh, again in a very kind of uh, male dominated community uh, of miners. Mm. Um, and I had to explain to um, every household just about that I visited that. Um, they would no longer be getting eight tons of fuel a year, it would be two tons of smokeless fuel. And then try and explain something about calorific value of fuel, and that actually it would last them as long as eight tons. Um, which you can imagine, um, uh, coming from kind of this young woman who uh, didn't seem to know anything about mining, um, it was quite a difficult ask, and um, I learnt words that I didn't know existed. We wrestled with industrial emissions and something called the dark smoke permitted period Regul regulations <laughs> and a little chart that had to oh, be carried. I I the micro that. Ringelman, which oh, one yeah. put oh, against right. the uh, the smoke emission. If the smoke was dark enough for long enough, yeah. led to uh, a prosecution. You've got to remember in 1959 there were race riots in North Kensington and that was where the first group, major group for West Indians moved north of the river. The first group was of course in Brixton. Up there was a shortage of accommodation. These were big four or five storey houses with attics and basements. And Rackman moved in using very strong arm tactics. He would walk around his empire with two Staffordshire Bull Terriers and always accompanied by a number of rather evil looking men, I don't know what they were. And we had to try and do something for these people. And I go in these houses up and down the staircase fearlessly. I think I'm back now, I must be an idiot. You'd find one family in every room, no bathrooms, and we work to try and alviate the conditions. But we'd go in just with a tape measure, okay. a clipboard, and, did and try and. Did anyone suffer any physical violence? Oh, yeah, I did. did yeah, you? yeah um, I was actually knocked down a staircase. Were you? Um, I was threatened um, uh, by one of Rackman's people. Um, I was chased out of two houses because the Chief Public Health Inspector said, the minute's violent, run. Yeah. And, well, I, with some dignity, now I'll run. <laughs> and um, got him a little mini and drove away. What Rackman did was he brought the attention of the general public to the housing conditions in a yeah. way that perhaps all of the other measures didn't. Yeah. But those poor families had the most appalling time. My grandmother uh, lived in one of the last areas that was cleared in Leeds. She oh. lived in a back-to-back -back with an outside toilet about three doors up in the street. But actually she lived in a community, a real oh. community. It was 
an absolute crying shame that we were breaking that community up because there was nowhere to house so many people oh. close together again. <coughs> and the houses weren't the best houses in the world, but having said that, some of the houses we're building now still probably no, um, aren't the best houses. Uh, and it would be interesting if only we could go back and look to say, you know, how much difference have we made? Mm. I don't believe that the general improvement areas and housing action areas particularly always was a good way of spending money. The main thing I remember from our time at Hammersmith and Fulham in the 1970s was something that came to be known as Operation Meetup. Yes. There was a meat processing factory and it looked very suspicious because every time I asked them to do something they did it instantly just like that. However small it was they never complained and generally we became very suspicious of them and it ended up with us carrying out surveillance in cars watching what they were doing. And I remember sitting in a car with, uh, with Andrew uh, on surveillance mm. uh, one night, um, a bit like uh, the old uh, TV programme Sweeney. Yes. Um, and uh, then the police came and raided the, the, mm. uh, uh, the establishment. But we found in there lots of unfit meat um, and that was part of a, of a, a nationwide distribution chain for unfit um, uh, meat. If you look back through the annals of the Chartered Institute and, and, and old environmental health news, you will find periodically some form of Operation Meat Hook that has had to, to take place as a result of the criminal value of unfit meat. Mm. Echoed recently by the horse meat scandal mm. right. only yeah. this year. Well, what goes around comes around. The issue today is around mm -hmm. better regulation, it's around reducing the burdens on business and allowing entrepreneurs to spring up all over the place and, and develop uh, uh, businesses. But of course without regulatory controls and without the sorts of controls which have been put in for very good reason, then we will have these types of yeah. events occurring yes. again and again and again. Health and safety has been blamed for uh, the costs it imposes on business. Mm. But actually, it's the lawyers pursuing mm. uh, accident claims and mm. ill health claims, and it's the insurers who are drumming up business for themselves in covering firms mm. yes. uh, against uh, accidental mm. claims and ill health claims. That's where the real costs are. Yeah. The burdens imposed on business by regulation are minuscule yeah. and, in my view, are very worthwhile. Mm. I believe that we are the original public health professional mm. and that we should not be worried about this. There are great opportunities and some of our younger colleagues are taking it yeah. and that really we've had, what is it, 150 years of history. It's being for public benefit and I think we're going to go even further. Mm. Um, the great kind of value that this profession has is its ability to actually join up dots and problem solve mm. and I think um, we should apply ourselves and not be frightened of applying ourselves to all the, the kind of public Absolutely. health problems that are there Absolutely. because nobody else has the same ability that actually we have and we should continue shouting and blowing our own trumpets about that. Right. Um, so when we're talking about engaging the public, um, whether it's around diet, obesity, um, or around more physical conditions around climate change, um, we are actually part of the problem solvers and probably the profession that can bring others in who can help. And at the forefront of the new way of thinking about how you engage and empower other people. Today, the CIEH is at the centre of a range of activities spanning the world. It has an international membership and accredits 21 environmental health degrees and MSc programmes in six countries, with a US subsidiary and offices in London, Cardiff, Belfast, Dubai and Orlando. It is the world's leading examination body in food testing and training. All profits, whether from training, events or consultancy, are gift aided to the charity for improving people's health through the development and application of environmental health. Design and marketing are important to the CIEH. It has a large creative output, both in print and online. As well as certificates, brochures and course materials, it produces books. Putting Wrong Things Right is a history of the CIEH published to mark the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. The book has been carefully assembled 
using reminiscences and photographs contributed by members. It records, in their social and political context, six decades of environmental health. Here are vivid stories told from the front line, for example, of the coronation of the Aberfan landslide, of encounters with the slum landlord Peter Rackman, and of a national typhoid scare that alarmed the country in 1964. It's a living history, told in the first person. To today's environmental health practitioners, thick smogs and tin baths, kit bags and tins of corned beef must seem like ancient history. One thing is certain, today you must be well connected to keep up. Environmental health has become more specialised and there are many more settings in which its practitioners now work. I'm Kate Harris and I am a primary authority officer working in local government um, in partnership with a large retailer. I'm really proud that I do a job where I feel that I contribute to the public good. Mm. That's really important to me mm. and you know over the last few years I've considered what I want to do with my life and things but it always comes back to this and I genuinely love my profession. I love working in local government actually um, because I feel like I'm doing some good. I'm James Hoskin Good, I'm the Technical Safety Manager for pret a -Manger. I enjoy the variety of the profession, uh, the ability to, to move from one aspect to another, so from housing to health and safety to food to pollution. Um, I obviously specialise in food and health and safety. Uh, that's what initially got me into the job, was the ability to move from um, one specialism to another. I'm James Sargent, currently the Head of Compliance at Consultancy Shield Yourself. I was previously an enforcement officer at a, a local authority in Inner London. I enjoy the fact that it's given me a great grounding, the public side, to be able to work in the private sector and actually achieve compliance and public health from a different angle and avenue. We actually yeah. have the opportunity to, to change the, uh, the, the understanding, the culture within a business. As a profession, we're born negotiators. Yeah. We'll be able, we have to be able to project manage, no matter whether it's small or large. We have to be persuaders, essentially. If you're good at communicating, you're very, very good at trying to influence change. And the, really the best way to do it is through interpersonal skills and, and your charisma. Yeah. And I think if, if, you rec if you recognise as a good officer, an individual, you can advance in the private sector. Some of the opportunities that I've had, you know, mentoring students, is really rewarding. Okay. Um, sitting on the various management boards, again, it's really rewarding. Working with the Jamaican Association of Public Health. We've all worked together yeah. at various festivals. The hardest thing about the whole festival is probably the conditions that you're in. You know, you're in a field, particularly the year that we did it. It yeah. was another very wet. We had mud halfway up our legs with Wellington's. Campsite was flooded. My yeah. tent leaks. Extreme conditions. But the whole emphasis is about we're ensuring public safety but also there's an element of fun. It, yeah. it, 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 all okay. the team are there to have fun. They try and engage with fun with the vendors. Probably the best thing is that we get to see some of the world's best bands up yeah. close and personal backstage and, oh. and, and on all next to the stage as well. Both James and I were volunteers in the CIH food safety team at both the Olympic and the Paralympic Games. We worked alongside them to do visits to the food traders in the Olympic and Paralympic venues to make sure that the food being served to the athletes, the VIPs, the guests and the general public was all safe for them to eat. Such a high profile event, particularly when you've got such a high concentration of people sure. and the world's eyes were on London. It was very hard very work. Rewarding. Yep. being yeah. part of something that was such a huge success and had such a huge impact on the country. Mm. Yeah. New hazards have emerged and there are always more on the horizon. As soon as one problem is solved, another appears. In order to be equipped to face them, we need to learn from those who have travelled the same route as us in the past. The collective knowledge and wisdom of a profession is held in many forms, but memories and stories are particularly important. Some from the last 60 years have now been gathered into putting wrong things right. The book is respectfully offered to the environmental health practitioners of the past, present and future, and to the public who may appreciate knowing more about the work of the environmental health profession to help keep them healthy and safe.